Hello data pros, and welcome back to another exciting video in our AI and ML series. In our previous video, we delved into key machine learning algorithms, exploring the fundamentals of supervised and unsupervised learning. We also demonstrated practical examples of regression, classification, and clustering to illustrate their real-world applications. Today, we're diving into one of the most critical yet often underestimated steps in machine learning, feature engineering. Now, think of feature engineering as preparing your ingredients before cooking a great meal. No matter how powerful your algorithm is, if the input data is not clean, relevant, and well-prepared, you're just not going to get a great result. Models only learn from what data we feed them. That's where feature engineering comes in, transforming, enriching, and reshaping raw data into something your ML model can actually learn from. Why is feature engineering important? Let's explore this in a bit more detail. First, machine learning models cannot naturally understand raw categorical or text data, such as gender, account type, or product category. To make this information usable, we convert it into a clean, numerical format using techniques like encoding, scaling, and normalization. Another key part of feature engineering is aggregating data over time to generate meaningful signals. For example, Calculating the total number of purchases or the number of complaints a customer made in the last six months can provide strong indicators for predicting churn. We also often need to join data from multiple sources. For instance, combining customer profiles with their transaction history and service desk interactions gives a much more complete picture and improves model performance. In addition, well-designed features, like customer or product-level features, can be built once and reused across multiple models or teams. This promotes consistency, reduces duplication, and saves both time and cost. Finally, effective feature engineering ensures that the right features are available and reliable at inference time. Once a model is deployed, you can simply pass in a primary key like customer ID and the system will retrieve all the relevant features from the feature store automatically. This eliminates the need to manually recalculate features during inference time. Many of the tools and techniques used in data engineering can also be used for feature engineering, and these two streams may appear to be overlapping. However, the key difference lies in their focus. Data engineering is primarily concerned with the collection, storage, and processing of data for use cases like business intelligence and data analytics. In contrast, the goal of feature engineering is to increase the ability of machine learning algorithms to learn from the dataset and thus make more accurate and scalable predictions. Feature engineering, and especially the feature store, plays a key role in the entire machine learning lifecycle. It all starts with raw data sources. From there, we perform featureization, which simply means transforming and enriching that raw data into meaningful and usable features. These features are then stored in a feature store table, making them easily accessible and reusable. Next, we use those features to train a machine learning model. And once the model is trained, we use it to make predictions. This phase is generally called inference. All right, let's jump into Databricks and see how all of this comes together in action. I've got three notebooks and a folder with the source files used in this demo. For simplicity, I'm using CSV files as the data source, but in a real-world scenario, these would typically come from Databricks tables. The first notebook handles featureization, where raw data is transformed into meaningful features and saved into the Databricks feature store. The second notebook covers model training. It uses the features from the feature store to train a machine learning model and then registers the model for future use. The third notebook focuses on inference, predicting customer churn using the trained and registered model. These notebooks and data files are available through the GitHub link provided in the video description. Let's start with the first notebook. This is where we load the raw data from CSV files, including customer details, financial transactions, and customer service interactions. I've also printed out a few rows from each dataset so you can get a feel for what the raw data actually looks like. We then clean the column names by replacing any spaces or special characters like slashes with underscore. This helps make them more compatible with common machine learning algorithms and with Databricks Unity Catalog. Next, we handle missing values. 
For example, if a customer's age or credit score is missing, we fill it with the average value calculated from all remaining customers. But if important fields like income range are missing, we simply skip those records to keep the data clean. Then, we create aggregated features by combining transactional and interaction data with the customer data. For example, we calculate the total money spent and the number of transactions per customer. Similarly, we calculate the average satisfaction scores and count the number of complaints from customer interactions. These aggregated features provide stronger signals for the predictions we are going to make. Since income ranges are text, we convert them into numeric averages for effective use in modeling. Customer tenure, which measures how many days a customer has been with the business. We also drop columns that don't help prediction or do not provide any meaningful signal, such as names or email addresses. We then encode categorical features. For example, ordinal encoding is used when categories have a natural order, like card tier, which we convert into numbers based on its rank. On the other hand, one-hot encoding is applied when categories don't have a meaningful order. For instance, gender is transformed into separate binary columns, one for each category. Please take a look at the dataset to see how these two encoding methods produce outputs. Next, we scale the numerical features with large scale difference so that no single feature unfairly influences the model just because it has a larger range of values. For example, a feature like income might range in the thousands, while age might only go up to around 100. Without scaling, the model might pay more attention to income just because it's on a bigger scale. So, we use standard scaling techniques to bring all numerical features onto a similar range. Once that's done, we combine everything into our final feature data frame. This includes the customer ID, encoded categorical features like gender and card tier, and all the scaled numeric features. At this point, it's important to drop any raw or intermediate columns that are no longer needed so that only the final, clean features are saved into the feature store. Finally, we create a feature store table using these enriched features. This table is saved in a centralized location in Unity Catalog, making it easy to reuse across different stages of the machine learning lifecycle, like model training, evaluation, and inference, all while ensuring consistency and governance. At this point, I encourage you to take a moment to look at the enriched features in the feature store and observe how they differ from the raw source data we started with. Let me show you what this feature table looks like in the Databricks UI. Just navigate to Features under the Machine Learning section, and here you'll find the feature table we've just created. Now it's time to move on to the second notebook, where we train our machine learning model. We start by loading the label data, specifically the customer ID and whether each customer has churned in the past. In this demo, we're using a CSV file, but in a real-world scenario, this historical data would typically come from a table in your data platform. Now comes the powerful part. Instead of manually joining or processing all our feature columns again, we simply connect to the feature store table we created earlier. By using a feature lookup, we automatically bring in all the enriched features for each customer, using the customer ID as the key. This gives us a clean and ready-to-use training dataset, which we convert to a pandas data frame for use with Scikit-learn. We then split the data into two parts, the input features and the label we want to predict. Now it's time to train the model. We use a random forest classifier, a popular machine learning algorithm that works well out of the box. We also use EmilFlow to automatically log the model's parameters, metrics, and other details. Once the model is trained, we log it to EmilFlow and register it so that it can be used later for inference, like in batch scoring or real-time predictions. We'll talk more about EmilFlow in another video, but at a high level, EmilFlow is an open-source ML lifecycle management tool that simplifies tracking, packaging, and deploying machine learning models across different environments. Now, let me show you the model in the Databricks UI. Go to Models under Machine Learning, and you'll find the churn prediction model we just registered. The model registry tracks versions automatically. If you retrain the model with new data or a different algorithm, a new version is created. This helps you manage and compare models easily. 
Finally, the third notebook handles inference. Here, we create a small data frame with customer IDs for whom we want predictions. We define a helper function to get the latest version of the model from the MLflow model registry, ensuring we always use the most up-to-date model. Next, we perform batch scoring using the feature engineering client, which automatically fetches all the required features for these customers from the feature store. This means we don't need to manually join or prepare features during inference. The feature engineering API takes care of that for us. Here are the churn predictions for these customers. One means the customer is at risk of churn and may leave if no action is taken. Zero means the customer is likely to stay. At this point, it's worth mentioning that feature engineering jobs are typically scheduled to run at regular intervals. This ensures that features for new customers are continuously added and that feature tables remain up to date. In simple terms, this allows us to make predictions for new customers as well. We'll talk more about how to measure model performance in upcoming videos. But for now, it's important to understand that a model's accuracy can decline over time as the world around us changes. When that happens, you can retrain the model using fresh data by rerunning the training notebooks. This helps keep predictions accurate and relevant. Congratulations. You've just learned the end-to-end -end feature engineering process from raw data all the way to final predictions. That's all for today. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with our latest content. Thanks for watching.